Good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting of 2024 in session 6 of the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. We have two members joining us remotely today, Maggie Chapman, MSP and Paul Kane, MSP. We also have two new members of our committee and I would like to thank Megan Gallagher and Annie Wells for their contributions to the committee over the time that they were here with us. And I would like to welcome to the committee Tess White and Pam Gossel on our return. Our first agenda item is to invite Pam Gossel and Tess White to declare any relevant interests. And I'll start with Pam, please. Good morning, committee. Uh, it's great to be back. And I have no relevant interests or any declaration to declare. Thank you. Thank you. Tess, please. Um, thank you, convener. I have no relevant uh, interest to declare. Thank you. Our second agenda item is consideration of the following negative Scottish statutory instrument, SSI 2024-249, the Upper Tribunal for Scotland, Bus Registration Appeals Rules of Procedure, Regulations 2024. And I refer members to paper one. Do members have any comments to make on the instrument? No. Okay. Thank you. That concludes consideration of the SSI. Our third agenda item is consideration of the following two draft affirmative instruments. The Draft Upper Tribunal for Scotland Bus Registration Appeals Composition Regulations 2024 and the Draft Upper Tribunal for Scotland Transfer of Functions of the Transport Tribunal Regulations 2024. And I welcome to the meeting Siobhan Brown, Minister for Victims and Community Safety and Alistair Thompson, Senior Policy Officer Tribunals. Thank you for joining us this morning and I refer paper members, apologies, to paper two and invite the Minister to speak to the draft instruments. Thank you, convener, and good morning, committee. The instruments that are before you are the Upper Tribunal for Scotland Transfer of Functions of Transport Tribunal Regulations 2024 and the Upper Tribunal for Scotland Bus Registration Appeals Composition Regulations 2024. These regulations are part of a package of four instruments that are all closely connected and which were all laid on the same date. The two affirmative instruments are important as they will continue to work to bring existing tribunal functions into the Scottish tribunal structure and are essential as a part of a wider package to enforce bus services improvement partnerships. The first instrument, if passed, will transfer the devolved functions of the Transport Tribunal into the Upper Tribunal for Scotland. Those functions are the appeals functions currently exercised by the Transport Tribunal in relation to certain financial penalties imposed by the Traffic Commissioner for Scotland on bus operators for failures to comply with the certain statutory requirements set out at Section 39 of the Transport Scotland Act 2001. The regulations will also make transitional provisions to ensure that any live appeals before the Transport Tribunal transfer to the Upper Tribunal. Equivalent bus enforcement powers conferred on traffic commissioners in England and Wales have an appeal route directly to the UK Upper Tribunal, so hearing appeals against service standard decisions in the Upper Tribunal for Scotland will ensure equal access to justice for any cross-border operators. The second instrument, if passed, will make provision for the comp composition of the upper tribunal when deciding appeals against certain penalties which can be imposed against an operator of a local bus service under sections 39 of the Transport Scotland Act 2001 and service standard decisions made by the Traffic Commissioner for Scotland in connection with bus services improvement partnerships. Members of the Upper Tribunal can be legal, judicial or ordinary members. When deciding the appeals outlined above, these regulations provide that the Upper Tribunal may consist of one, a legal or a judicial member of the Upper Tribunal acting alone, or two, two or three legal or judicial members of the Upper Tribunal, or three, the President of the Scottish Tribunals acting alone or with no more than two legal or judicial members. The power to choose between the compositions described above is delegated to the President of the Scottish Tribunals. The, the President of the Scottish Tribunals, Lady Wise, was consulted regarding both of these draft sets of regulations in line with the requirements of the Tribunal Scotland Act 2014, 
Lady Wise has indicated that she was content with the two instruments and a public consultation that included these regulations was also conducted and closed on the 27th of October in 2023. I understand that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered both these regulations on October the 1st and were content. I just want to highlight that these regulations will have no impact on individual members of the public as they relate only to appeals rights of local of bus operators and local transport authorities. But I'm happy to answer any questions, convener. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, members, do we have any questions or comments that we wish to make on these instruments? I see no indications. Therefore, we'll move on to the next part of our agenda, which is agenda item four. This is the formal business in relation to these instruments. And it is consideration of the motions for approval for the affirmative instruments. And I invite the minister to move the motions S6M14609 that the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee recommends that the Upper Tribunal for Scotland Bus Registration Appeals Composition Regulations 2024 draft be approved and S6M14610 that the Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee recommends that the Upper Tribunal for Scotland transfer of functions of the Transport Tribunal Regulations 2024 draft be approved. Thank you. Do members have any final comments? There's no indications, so we are all agreed. Um, next, I invite the committee to agree to delegate to me approval of the publication of a short factual report on our deliberations on the affirmative SSIs that we have considered today. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Thank you. That completes our consideration of the two affirmative instruments. And I thank the Minister and her official for joining us today. Thank you. We will now suspend briefly for a changeover of panel.
Welcome back, everyone. We now move on to our fifth agenda item, which is evidence as part of the committee's pre-budget scrutiny 2025-26. We will hear from two panels this morning, and I welcome to the meeting our first panel, Catherine Murphy, Executive Director for Engender, Lewis Ryder-Jones, Advocacy Advisor for Oxfam Scotland, and Catherine Robertson, Policy Officer for Zero Tolerance. You're all very welcome, and thank you for attending this morning. I refer members to papers three and four and invite each of our witnesses to make a short opening statement, starting with Catherine Murphy, please. Thanks, convener. Uh, uh, my name is Catherine Murphy. I'm uh, the executive director of Engender. Uh, for those who don't know us, Engender is a leading feminist policy and advocacy organisation working to secure women's uh, social, political and economic equality uh, and to realise women's rights. We work to make visible the impact of structural inequality in Scotland uh, and we produce research, analysis and recommendations for change. Um, we are of the firm view that gender mainstreaming is essential uh, and it is the primary route by which uh, we can integrate uh, an equality-based approach across uh, the policy-making process in Scotland. So we're really grateful to the committee for inviting us along today to discuss that. Um, despite gender mainstreaming being an evolving approach reaching kind of 30 years of development now at, at European and international level. Scotland is still unfortunately a bit behind the curve on these issues on equalities and gender mainstreaming despite a lot of effort in recent years so we really need to from our point of view pick up the pace so we hope to be able to discuss that with you today. Thank you. Catherine Robertson please. Uh, thank you very much to the committee for the opportunity to speak today and to give evidence. Uh, Zero Tolerance is an organisation that focuses on the primary prevention of men's violence against women and girls by tackling its root cause, gender inequality. Eradicating violence against women and girls is essential to building an inclusive, safe and equal Scotland. Weaving gender equality into the everyday fabric of Scottish life is a central component for preventing Vogue. Many of the areas covered by the National Performance Framework and its outcomes are highly gendered and the MPF needs to recognise this to meet the needs of women and girls in Scotland and to improve their well-being. <clears throat> Achieving gender equality is a prerequisite not just of ending violence but of approving, improving Scotland's performance across all areas. As our sister organisation and gender has argued, the MPF and its outcomes should be the cornerstone of how the Scottish Government will achieve equality. To ensure this, however, Zero Tolerance believes that three improvements are needed for the MPF and its outcomes, and we urge the committee to reflect this to the Scottish Government. <coughs> Firstly, we think it is essential that there is an outcome dedicated to gender equality with strong VOG-related indicators. Without this, it's likely that gender equality will be deprioritised. Secondly, we think that a gender must be mainstreamed across all the relevant outcomes. While we recognise that there has been substantial progress, there's still many gaps to be seen. And thirdly, we want to echo concerns raised by gender about the effectiveness of the MPF being undermined by a lack of gendered policy coherence. Without these three points, we think it's unlikely that the MPF and its outcomes will make substantial progress towards gender equality. Thank you. Thank you. And Lewis Ryder-Jones, please. Thank you. And uh, <coughs> just to echo comments, thank you for inviting Oxfam to give evidence today. Um, my name is Lewis Ryder-Jones. Um, Oxfam has a long-standing interest in reducing inequalities because we believe reducing inequalities of all types is a, is a, is a prerequisite for tackling poverty in Scotland and elsewhere. Um, we also have a long-standing in interest in the MPF and the national outcomes. Um, as a means for richer measures of national progress. Um, we were heavily engaged in the process of setting the previous set of national outcomes back in 2018. And we are also part of the expert advisory group uh, that has supported the process this time around. Um, we broadly welcome the national outcomes, uh, the draft national outcomes, as they've been presented to Parliament earlier this year. Um, However, we think there is a lot more to do to make the, the, the meaningful step towards having good outcomes towards their implementation. Um, and a big part of that must be that uh, national outcomes become part and parcel to the process of policy making and spending decisions within the Scottish Parliament and by the Scottish Government. Uh, to do this requires changes across various areas, but 
first and foremost requires bolstering the uh, legislative underpinnings for the national outcomes. We believe that's really important um, and everything else uh, likely stems from this. I'm happy to come back to that over the course of today. We've also been involved with the uh, national outcomes indicators selection process uh, through the expert advisory group and we are um, we remain uh, less than um, impressed by the wider public consultation that's involved in setting the national indicators and we really um, implore this committee to take a serious interest in the national outcomes when they're presented to the Scottish Parliament next year um, and the process by, of setting them must run through the, the next five-year period in order to make sure the national outcomes become meaningful. Happy to come back to that as well. Thanks. Thank you all. We'll now move on to questions from members. And I'm going to start with my question. Has the Scottish Government's approach to its review of national outcomes, which has been focused primarily on the outcomes themselves and not the indicators or wider framework, in respect of equalities and human rights, has it allowed for sufficient change to be made? Uh, Catherine Murphy. Sure. Um, thanks, Kimina. Um, so. In, in many ways, we, we think that there has been certainly been progress with this set of outcomes. Obviously, it's very hard to fully assess that without the indicators. I would say the two things that we've been particularly pleased to see is the work that's been done around care and an indicator on care uh, being included in this iteration. We are also uh, we were pleased at, the, at least that there is a recognition, a stated recognition of equality within the broader equality and human rights outcome. If uh, we are still somewhat frustrated that uh, there seems to be resistance to uh, transferring and tracking along the lines of the, SDG, uh, the SDGs, um, we had previously called for inclusion of an outcome that echoed SDG 5 on gender equality. Um, but that has been resisted again. It was resisted in the first iteration. It's been resisted again. We're quite frustrated because we don't think that that uh, recognises international best practice on mainstreaming, which we can talk a bit about if, if you would like to. But the, uh, the international best practice demonstrates quite clearly that we should take a twin dual track approach to gender mainstreaming, which means you need to prioritise it and give it specific prioritisation, but also integrate it throughout all of uh, your headline outcomes. So I'm frustrated that we've, we've, we've not made more progress on that. Um, what I would say is, in terms of the, the process, uh, obviously, as Lois was saying, there's still a lot of work to be done on the indicators, and we'll be very interested to see what comes out of that process. We you know, there's a lot of work to be done to integrate gender right across all of those indicators. Um, we had submitted, uh, as, uh, we submitted a, a submission, obviously, to um, the consultation. We participated in a, an event that was a, a kind of meeting, a focus group meeting on gender. Um, so that was a pretty standard kind of consultation approach, but I think it certainly could have been more of an exchange of information. We, we gave our feedback, but we haven't really heard very much about how that was how that was used and utilised and what some of the, the rationale for some of the decisions were around the fact they didn't take on board everything that we said. So just very quickly, what I would say is um, specifically around uh, SDG 5, uh, we understand there's been a thematic gender review. Um, that's not been shared publicly. Uh, we haven't seen what went into that. Um, so it's hard to comment on how good it was or the strength of it. Um, but one of the two things I would say is that um, we are a bit sceptical about how strong it was given how weak we believe the representation of violence against women is in, in the, uh, the outcomes. And also the other major one is women's representation and participation in public life, which is a major feature of, the, of SDG 5, is barely really represented in, in the new outcomes. And I think a, a really thorough strategic gender review would have would have certainly um, made a, a priority of those issues. So, so I'd be interested. I'd be really interested in the committee exploring that a bit more about actually what went into that review and what does it look like. Okay. Thank you, Catherine Robertson. Please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to echo everything that Catherine has said. We agree with all those points, especially around the need for a gender equality outcome. Um, 
and I echo as well the views around the thematic gender review. While we're pleased that one was carried out, again, we have the same concerns about why we don't know what was involved in it. Um, we also wanted to highlight the fact that um, despite recognition in the gender review that better mainstreaming is needed throughout um, all the outcomes um, and throughout the national performance framework in general, um, there's still missing vital opportunities in the outcomes to embed gender equality, so we're wondering why there's a bit of a, a gap there. Um, but in terms of like the Scottish Government's approach to um, doing this work, we, were, um, we wanted to welcome the inclusion of uh, children's voices in the review through the Children's Parliament. However, um, we wanted to note that um, the children involved in this part of the report also highlighted the need for gender equality in their experience of education under the Education and Learning Outcome. And seeing as Article uh, 19 of the UNCRC states that children must be listened to and taken seriously, we therefore um, think our recommendation around um, education um, high highlighting the need for schools to be equally safe um, for women and girls is particularly pressing, given that that was highlighted by the children involved in this review. Um, I think I'll keep my comments to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Lewis, please. Um, to start with, we're supportive of the need for a gender equality outcome and, and, and recognise its, its conspicuous absence, uh, especially if we consider alignment to the SDGs, as already stated, and, and, and the importance of that, and the stated aim by the Scottish Government since 2018 to align to the SDGs. And we've made this point several times, that alignment has always been very loose and top level, and there's been very little consideration of how indicators match up with SDG indicators, but also where the gaps are, where SDGs and, and gender equality is clearly an important gap. Um, that said, we really welcome the proposed change on adding a national outcome on care. Oxfam has led the campaign for uh, this addition uh, over the past uh, two years, and, and, and we really warmly welcome. But its addition, is highly dependent on the nature of the indicators that follow this new outcome. And we would say the same about other new and changed outcomes and are fully supportive and echo the comments on the importance of disaggregated data collection uh, when it comes to indicator development. I mean, to use an example, um, if we create an indicator around the financial well-being of carers in Scotland, first of all, we need to know what type of carers we're talking about. Are they paid? Are they unpaid? What, who are they caring for? Secondly, we need to know what gender those carers are to be able to make meaningful progress or be able to measure progress so then we can make meaningful changes at the policy level to, to support that. Um, it's unclear at this stage whether we will have that level of uh, data collection. And we think it's really important is where gaps appear in the current, um, in the current methods of data collection that can be used to support indicator development, that we recognise that where gaps exist, that we can fill them over time, uh, simply, simply trying to use a proxy indicator because the right data doesn't exist would be an inappropriate uh, um, uh, long-term outcome for that national outcome over the course of five years. It's better to have a gap in the short term and try to fill that gap with new data collection methods, accepting the resource implications of that down the line. Um, we are... Uh, I've mentioned about top-level alignment to the SDGs, um, but of course uh, there are other slight gaps around equalities. There is, a, there is a distinct lack in the current MPF and the national outcomes of reference to economic inequality, um, despite the fact that economic inequality features in the well-being economy monitor, which is uh, supposed to be aligned to the national outcomes. Uh, and, and this is an important omission, and we really, we're, we really welcome the fact that under the poverty outcome there is an acknowledgement around economic inequality in the wording of that outcome, but it follows that the indicators that are developed for that outcome must also include something on economic inequality, particularly wealth inequality. And the issue of wealth inequality is not something where we lack data. We, we collect data on wealth inequality in this country, and the, the latest figures should be out very, very soon. They were supposed to come out in the summer. To not see those in the new iteration of the national outcomes would be hugely disappointing. Um, and, and again, uh, in relation to the SDGs, and this is perhaps more of a controversial point, back in 2007, the MPF included targets within it. Now, these were removed 
um, in the latest iteration, uh, citing the need for continuous improvement and, and targets not being important for that. We're of the mind, if this framework should align to the SDGs, that targets are important. The SDGs have targets. They have targets that all must be completed by 2030. That is their purpose, to drive progress by a certain timeline. And they'll be replaced. But to not have targets, particularly around things like wealth inequality, we're very supportive of reducing wealth inequality and income inequality to a Palmer ratio of one. So that's where the top 10% of the population have the same income as the bottom 40%. Um, that should be in the SDGs. Uh, currently, it's not, and there's a there's a campaign to uh, to have that um, uh, included in the SDGs. But there are a host of other targets within the SDGs, not least on gender, that are lacking from the MPF. And to make the MPF more meaningful in the in the next five years, we would like to see the uh, inclusion of targets, particularly where there are policy. Uh, targets and statutory targets attached, namely child poverty and uh, climate action. Um, lastly, uh, on the uh, implementation side of the national outcomes, we really welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to include an implementation plan alongside the new national outcomes, and we think this will go some way to kind of bridge that gap. But as I said in my opening statement, um, to really bridge that gap, we'll have to go beyond an implementation plan for each national outcome, or for the national outcomes as an entire framework, and, be, and drive down into each individual national outcome, and also address issues of policy coherence between each of them, addressing trade-offs where they arise, and that's particularly true for gender equality. Um, I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you. We'll now move on to questions from Maggie Chapman, please. Thank, thanks very much, Karen, and good morning to the panel. Thank you for joining us this morning, and I'm sorry I'm not with you in, in person. Um, really, my, my question follows on from, from Lewis's last, last points around policy coherence. Uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine Robertson, you mentioned in your opening remarks that the need for policy coherence and the effectiveness of MPF potentially being undermined because of a lack of it. And I, I suppose I, I'm interested in, in your, your views of whether the MPF and whatever outcomes are, uh, are come out of it uh, 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 after the review, do we actually have the the capabilities and and, and the the equipment to to tackle um, inequalities given given our failings on policy coherence to, to date? Uh, Catherine Robertson, do you want to pick that up first? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to to speak on policy coherence. I'll keep my comments to maybe limited to. Um, equally safe, being that being our area of um, expertise. Um, but it does seem at the moment that there are a lot of opportunities missed between how the MPF is framed and how the goals of equally safe, even though the, they have a lot of the same um, ambitions in mind. Um, one of the ones that we picked up in our, um, in our response, and I think in gender did as well, was around communities and how that, that outcome wasn't specifically gendered despite being very much in line with um, Equally Safe. And there's an opportunity missed there for gender to be mainstreamed. Um, so I think in terms of what the things that have in the policies that we have, I think we do have them but they're not coordinated with each other as it stands. Um, and I think there needs to be a re-look at the outcomes through the perspective of Equally Safe. And are we taking all the opportunities across all the outcomes to embed primary prevention of violence against women and girls? Because there are opportunities missed, especially in communities, but in a range of different outcomes as well that we gave in our um, submission. So I think, um, I wonder, I think that's... Um, what we have to say about that. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Catherine Murphy, if I can come to you, a similar kind of question around how well equipped MPF is to actually tackle uh, inequalities given, given policy coherence failures. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And I will, I will get to policy coherence, but I wanted to take a, a, a step back from that first. So all of the evidence we have about how you actually achieve uh, gender equality and how you actually integrate it right across um, the policy making and decision making process, legislative process, etc., is there's different components that we need. We need leadership, we need visibility of the issue, 
uh, whole organisational shared responsibility, you need prioritisation, and really critically, you need resources and accountability mechanisms to make sure it gets done. And unfortunately, we know too well that if those things are not there, it just doesn't get done. Um, so from that point of view, uh, the National Outcomes Framework is really critical because it's the cornerstone for all of those things. Um, you know, it's where things like leadership, prioritisation, resources, etc., should flow from in terms of decision making. So the fact that gender equality is not more uh, uh, prioritised within uh, the outcomes framework is is really confusing to us. We we can't understand it. Um, and part of the reason for that is that policy coherence. So what we have seen in recent years is um, a really impressive commitment or sta you know, stated commitment to improve on equality issues through the National Advisory Council on Women and Girls, which is a really kind of like ambitious, transformative agenda for change. We've also got, as, uh, as Catherine said, equally safe. We have the Women's Health Plan. We have uh, a, a public sector equality uh, public sector equality duty review um, that has been promised and we did also have the human rights bill so we had all of these really strong ambitious um, pieces of work that are being done or are anticipated to be to be done inequalities but then to not have that really clearly aligned in the, na uh, the national outcomes framework is is we don't think it's strong enough and and it's not just about having a standalone uh, outcome on gender equality i mean for those you know sd uh, the sdgs also has a, a sdg 10 is a, a as a as a general reduce inequality uh, goal also um but it's not just about having that standalone one. You know, look, we, I'm slightly confused as to why we can't have more of a stated aim across the purpose of the outcomes framework. You know, at the moment, the purpose of it isn't clearly articulated as, as something that part of its aim is to reduce inequality. Um, and then also, there's been certainly improvements in this iteration of integrating more of an equalities and gendered focus across the goals, but there's definitely major omissions, and I've, I've mentioned some of them. Um, but it, I also think it's, for us, it's, it, 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 it almost reads as quite uh, reticent. And I can't really understand why it's not more forthright, because we do have all of these really impressive commitments. So why is there not that coherence across it? And why are we not being um, unapologetic in our aims around inequality? Um, so that, that's, that's really the, the, the principle. Um, and I also think that without um, really stating and, and creating a space within the outcomes framework for gender inequality, you're to some degree leaving these brilliant pieces of work like the Women's Health Plan, the National Advisory Council, Women and Girls, all of these really impressive pieces of work, you're kind of leaving them in a siloed place and they're disconnected from the overarching framework that everything else should emanate from. So I I, I, I think that it's going to be a missed opportunity if, if the government don't um, fix that between now and it being uh, finalised. Thanks, Catherine. Can I just pick up on, on, on one point or explore a little bit further? I mean, you talked about uh, some, of, some of the ambitions and, and obviously we had, there, there was a lot of hope from across uh, civil society and, and different sectors pinned on the human rights legislation. And I just wondered how you saw the role of human rights in the, the MPF, given that we, we seem to have lost that that kind of galvanising force behind behind them with, with the, that legislation not being brought forward, how, how well or, or, or what are the risks for national performance framework, but but also for actually tackling equalities and human rights um, in in um, injustices? How, how how do you see how do you see that? No. Yeah, I, I'll just touch on that. I'm sure others might want to come in as well. But on that specifically, I think uh, we had felt there was a lot of potential for the Human Rights Bill to introduce duties that would plug some of the gaps or move us forward, um, particularly in some of the weaknesses we know that there are in, in the implementation of the public sector equality duty, for example. And we thought that there was potential for the Human Rights Bill and the duties it would introduce to, to plug some of those gaps, move us forward in a much more progressive way. But one thing I would point out as well is it's not only really the Human Rights Bill that we've lost, 
cost. We've also, um, we since 2018, we've been promised a public sector equality duty review. Um, and that some of that has come forward, but it's been really kind of uh, uh, scaled back in quite a significant way since 2018. And we know that um, the public sector equality duty has a lot of potential, but it's not been utilised. And a lot of the things that are relevant to this discussion around the collection of data, the use of the um, you know, impact, equality impact assessments and, and make sure that they have a, a sufficient standard, the, the National uh, Outcomes Framework really does have the potential to create pressure internally around those things. So it almost becomes more important that it's included in the Outcomes Framework in the absence of a more thorough PSED review and the Human Rights Bill. So I, I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but I think it, it's, it, these things are two sides of the one coin, if you like, in terms of PSED and the Human Rights Bill. That, that's really helpful, Catherine. Thank you, uh, Lewis. Do you want? Do you have anything to add on on in this kind of area? Uh, yeah, on the on the policy agreements issues, um, I think our position is there's an array of things that are necessary to improve policy coherence with the national outcomes. We can't do one thing and expect policy coherence to improve. That that would be uh, um, wishful thinking, and, and I think it starts around the the process by which national outcomes are set. Uh, public engagement and the and, and the and the and the long-term impact of making this framework visible to a wider public within Scotland has the impact on government and Parliament of taking the framework more seriously. Let's be honest: this framework is set, then it sits there, and decisions are made. And after the decisions are made, they will assign a national outcome that that decision. That is generally how decisions have been made using this framework. So we need to reverse that. So public engagement goes one way. We were part of the, uh, the, the public consultation process in 2018. That engaged about 500 people across Scotland. We worked with Carnegie to deliver that. Um, and even that process wasn't enough for us at the time. This process didn't get close to that. So we have gone backwards in terms of our public engagement, not forwards. And we implore the government to use the next five-year period to use continuous engagement techniques around this framework to build its, build its uh, aware, build awareness of the framework in Scotland. Um, so secondly, it's, and it's something I touched on uh, at the start, uh, legislative um, underpinnings of this framework are weak. At, as it currently stands in the Community Empowerment Act that was set in 2015, it states that public authorities must have due regard to the national outcomes in carrying out their duties. Now, let's be honest. What does that mean? Does that mean that they have to think about them before they make a decision? No, it doesn't. So we need to strengthen that legislative underpinning, whether that's within the Community Empowerment Act or, as we propose, taking the national outcomes out of the Community Empowerment Act and putting them into a new Wellbeing and Sustainable Development Act, uh, something uh, we have been advocating for, for for a couple of years, along with various others, and something the Scottish Government had initially committed to doing, and in and, and, and this particular programme for government, have not uh, followed through on. We know there is a members' bill by Sarah Boyack that, that, that on this issue that is welcome, um, and we really hope the government gets behind that now. Um, we propose within that legislation that we change the wording around the national outcomes to not only uh, uh, have um, to promote and to deliver the national outcomes, but also to promote and deliver uh, the public engagement and consultation, and also, importantly, to consider policy coherence in their implementation. We think that should be written into the legislation, and that would, ha that would enforce um, a different approach to how the national outcomes are considered by not just government, not just parliament, but also public bodies and local authorities, remembering that this framework is supposed to be for all of Scotland. Um, uh, I'll stop there. There was a couple of other things, uh, but maybe we'll come back to around, around indicators. Thanks. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Karen. I'll leave it there. We'll move on to questions from Pam Gossel, please. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel, and thank you for the information so far. Zero tolerance and end gender have both suggested making slight changes to the wording of Scottish Government's national outcomes. Zero tolerance have suggested the addition of living free from violence on the equality and human rights outcome. End gender have suggested incorporating the current national performance framework's aim of reducing inequalities into uh, the new wording. 
Could you please expand on that decision and are uh, any other witnesses in agreement with these suggestions? So obviously speaking to Lewis afterwards, if I can get both views from both Catherine's first, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to comment on, on this question. Um, we want to see um, a definition that in includes violence and discrimination because violence is the reality of for far too many women and girls in Scotland. And if we don't name it for what it is, there will be no action around it. And we can't include violence underneath discrimination and they need to be given equal weighting. Um, we want to see adding free from violence because that will help ensure accountability for action around um, tackling violence against women and girls. Um, but also kind of related, well, very much related to that is that violence against women and girls is often dismissed. Um, it's not seen as the violence that it is. So it, it absolutely needs to be included in the definition because this will help bring the attention and action that we want to see around ending violence against women and girls. So that's why we, we think it should be included in the definition alongside discrimination. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, we, we probably, I think we probably would like to see quite a number of significant changes. I think the primary one would be, as I mentioned prim primarily, the purpose of what we're trying to achieve with the outcomes. I think that should, inequality, uh, reducing inequality should be integrated within the purpose. I'm not saying it should be its sole purpose, but it should certainly be a, a, a feature of it. Um, I think that um, we want to probably, I think there's some strong, there is some really kind of strong improvements. As Lewis mentioned, uh, the, the new outcome on care. Um, some of the other uh, outcomes have also kind of integrated some mention of women's experiences. So in economy and fair work, there's some recognition around unfair pay gaps, for example. But we would like uh, really across all of the outcomes for there to be more of a recognition of the differential experiences for people um, and the impact of structural gender inequality on women and how that manifests in these different areas. Because if it's in our experience and in, in the kind of global evidence base on mainstreaming, if it's not named, if it's not acknowledged, it doesn't get done. Um, so I think we would probably we would be looking for uh, some changes across the different outcomes and some there's some I mentioned some of the primary, uh, there's a, a few omissions, but one of the, the two most important ones that we can see uh, are uh, violence against women, as Catherine mentioned, that's not strong enough. Um, and we would want uh, that to be made much stronger, but also um, the full and effective participation of women in decision making in public life and leadership positions, that's not strong in it at all. Um, and I don't know if any of the committee are familiar with, but we, we, we do do some work now. It's not perfect data collection, but uh, we every few years do a report in Scotland on that we call Sex and Power, and we track um, women's uh, representation and positions of power um, across Scotland. And what we found is that 64% of leadership positions in Scotland are taken up by men. Um, that there's major gaps in women's representation in public life in Scotland um, and that we track 38 different categories of, of leadership positions and 33 men are overrepresented in. So that, you know, we know there's an issue. So why that's been om omitted, I'm not sure. Um, and then again, just to go back to what we said, ultimately what we would really like is that there, there to be a, a gender inequality outcome um, and we think that that's absolutely in line with SDGs and what interna international best practice tells us. Um, and it's, we think it's necessary. Um, so those would be the, the primary changes that we would, we would want to see. Uh, nothing, nothing significant. I, I, I might just add uh, uh, two little things, though. I mean, I think that l the last two uh, points that Catherine mentioned there the, the, the last being on the the importance of mainstreaming embedding across outcomes and having something standalone and visible. Uh, I think the same applies to the care outcome. I think there was an early discussion when we were thinking that through that care does should appear across several different national outcomes because of its uh, um, 
significance and foundational importance to how society functions, whether that's unpaid care or paid care, I mean a very broad definition. And, and, and therefore, there is an argument to say that care should appear across others as well. And I, I think we are very supportive of that uh, position around gender inequality as well. Um, it's not just about embedding across different outcomes, it's also about making it visible in its own right. And, and I think we're very supportive of that. Um, on the data collection and, 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 and the kind of out-of-government out data collection side of things, and uh, that report that Catherine mentioned is great, and I read it every time it comes out, um, the, uh, uh, there is a wealth of qualitative data being collected in Scotland by, a, uh, by an array of organisations across Scotland, and, 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 and we really implore the government to think through both the quantitative and qualitative data collection side for what they use in the national indicators going forward. There is obviously a limitation to the types of data that can be used by the statistics team within the Scottish Government, and I recognise that, but that doesn't mean signposting to other forms of measurement can't happen through the National Performance Framework to bring in other stakeholders, particularly those who don't work for government. And, and qualitative data, we know, gives a different uh, um, a, a different angle to issues such as gender equality that are often missing when we look at the numbers alone. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I've got another question, but I think some of it you've answered, so if you want to add to it. Um, obviously, gender inequality is an issue that I personally take very seriously, and uh, in gender and zero tolerance um, both express the need for specific outcome on gender uh, inequality as part of the Scottish Government's national outcomes. Can witnesses expand on where the current proposals fall short of supporting gender um, equality? And I know that you've touched on some of these in the last question, but is there anything you'd like to add to that where it falls short? Absolutely. Just very quickly, what I will add yeah. is one of the other things that's missing that is included in SG, SDG 5, which is obviously the gender equality uh, uh, SDG is around uh, a point also that, that Lewis made is around equality legisla is equalities legislation as well. And whilst a lot of that falls out with the, the um, devolved settlement, we think that there's, uh, there is lots that still can be done through PSED review, etc. Um, so the fact that that's not also tracked in the outcomes is disappointing. So that's something else that we would. But th the one thing I would, if and I, I apologise if I'm going to sound a bit like a broken record, but if there's one thing I, you know, one thing that I really want to leave with the committee is is around that dual track approach. 30 years of evidence on mainstreaming internationally, whether that's in EU institutions or in UN institutions, has shown time and time again that if you do not prioritise gender alongside integration, um, then it doesn't happen. It does, you do not fulfil the potential of mainstreaming if you don't have that prioritisation and then the integration across the different outcomes. And they call it twin or dual track. And it's the long established best practice. And, um, and, did, and I, what I can't understand is that we, we often hear back is that, oh, well, you know, we've just folded it all in. And, and I don't understand why we're still hearing that because the, the best practice is very, very clear. So that would be the one thing that, I, you know, that around that, uh, the standalone gender uh, indicator or outcome, sorry, and integrated across is, an, is, is a very clear dual track approach and the evidence supports that. And we don't really understand why there's reticence around it. Catherine, you just mentioned, didn't you, uh, there's evidence other places yet on that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I can certainly share it with the committee, but it largely comes from the e EU institutions who, across kind of European Parliament, European Commission, etc., they've been really, really at the forefront of gender mainstreaming for the last 20, 30 years, but also at, in, within the UN. The UN institutions have done an enormous amount of work, UN women and others. Um, so I can certainly share information around that specific issue with the committee. Um, yeah, we have that on hand, so I can, I'll can i send it over. Thank you. I think that's us. Thank you very much, convener. Completed. Thank you. Um, we now go to Evelyn Tweed, whose questions. Thank you, Evelyn. Thanks, convener, and uh, thanks for your comments so far. They've been really helpful. Um, my question is to follow on from Pam's uh, about the specific outcome on gender inequality, and if there was one, what sort of indicators would you want to flow from that? And maybe to Catherine Murphy first. Yeah, um, I think. I mean, we. I think that we would want to see largely a replication of what is not not all of it, and obviously, 
it, the SDGs is a, is a, has a global focus, so some of it will not be re relevant to Scotland, but a lot of it is, and I think it really covers off quite a, a consistent, well, co comprehensive list. So things, you know, as, as Lewis had said, we, it's great that we've got a care outcome, but too often we still haven't recognised that care, whether that's formal care in terms of how it's provided um, in the formal employment setting or unpaid care, it's overwhelmingly women that provide that. Um, and it has a massive bearing on women's inequality, access to resources, access to education, employment, etc. Um, so we would want, you know, the, the SDGs has a, a specific um, focus within SDG 5 on... Um, unpaid care. Um, also, as I said, the, the effective participation of women in public life, there's a, a clear focus on violence against women. There's a focus on women's economic resources. So say, for example, um, we, are, uh, we are one of the areas where we continually feel that women's specific differential needs and experiences are overlooked is in economic policy. So women's experiences of employment, the kind of jobs that they do, the contribution they make to the economy is often um, undervalued. Um, and investment in infrastructure is largely made on the basis of it being quite masculine uh, areas of the economy. Um, so there's also, you know, so from that point of view, having an, e having an economic part of it, um, there's also, as I said, the equality uh, a specific focus on equality legislation and working to progressively improve protections and that legislative underpinning, as Lewis had mentioned. So I think uh, the SDGs provides really a good framework um, for what that should look like. Um, there may be other things that we would want to include in it, um, but I think it doesn't... I, I mean, the only other... The other thing as well that possibly to mention is around um, competence and strategy an investment because one of the things, one of the big barriers that we see in Scotland to progress is that we don't have internally within Scottish Government and a lot of the institutions, we don't have sufficient gender competence um, or equalities competence and with the best will in the world that's going to take investment. So whether that could be folded in somewhere to possibly under the equalities legislation part that's about investment strategy and continual progression and development um, because we need an accountability structure for that because you can make the commitments um, but if the resources and investment and prioritisation doesn't follow we have very little accountability mechanisms to come back and say why is this not being done. Thank you. Um, I again echo everything that Catherine has said uh, as well. Um, we believe that um, SDG 5 needs to be replicated in the Scottish context. As Catherine said, not everything will work in the Scottish context, but we need to take that lens to it. And it has such a depth and, and um, expanse of area that we want to see that level of commitment seen in the national performance framework as well. Um, in terms of specific indicators, I can't give because we could, you know, have so many different indicators, but in terms of, you know, a few specific ones related to violence, um, in our original consultation response, we um, echoed how the SDG 5 talks about eliminating all forms of violence against women and girls. Um, but despite that, the national outcomes doesn't have specific indicators around crime and victimisation. So that would be one of our key indicators that we'd like to see. Um, there's also um, no indicators around um, sexual crimes, such as rape and sexual assault. So we would definitely want to see that as well. Um, and in regards to safer communities more broadly, um, we need to have an indicator related to sexual crime in related to domestic abuse, not just domestic abuse as well. Um, but again, really want to echo what Catherine mentioned about um, gender competency and ag having a gender lens, because it's not enough to, you know, we want to be collecting this data, we want to have the indicators, but if it's not being understood from this perspective of, um, gender inequality and the re lived reality that women and girls experience, then we're not going to have the targeted action that we need to see. So I think, uh, as Catherine said, investment in training, gender competency absolutely needs to come along with indicators and um, collecting um, intersectional data as well. Thanks. Um, 
a conversation about indicators, and I, and, I, and I maybe should have mentioned this at the start, can't, can't, can't avoid, first of all, addressing the fact that the current set of 81 indicators that exist for the current 11 national outcomes are not complete. So in a six-year time period, there are still gate data gaps for the existing national outcomes. Now, let, let, let's be frank about that. If we're not collecting data, and we're talking, I can't remember the exact number, somewhere between 10 and 20 indicators do not have data collection or they've not started collecting data. They've been identified, but the process of starting hasn't. I think it's on this parliament to hold the government account on that. And I don't think that's been a success over the last five year period. So I think we need to be frank about the existing framework and what we've said and done about those indicators before we talk about what comes next. And there is lots to talk about what comes next. And I agree with everything that's been said. Um, uh, on the SDGs, fully agree again. I mean, just a couple of examples on indicators and targets that could exist that don't, where we definitely collect data, but we don't present it in, in indicators currently. Uh, fuel poverty and homelessness are both individual uh, indicator targets within the SDGs. Um, I can provide where to look for that uh, on the UN documentation. We don't, we haven't, we've decided not to look at that within the MPF over the past five years, even, even though the fact that there are outcomes that are relevant to those. Um, and what that says is when the alignment took place between national outcomes and SDGs, the process of aligning the targets and indicators underneath those was never completed. And I think that has to be done first and foremost. I think there has been a recognition that that hasn't been done and it, it really needs to be a priority. Um, I mentioned this at the start as well. For us, wealth inequality and economic inequality is, is, uh, is a significant driver of other inequalities, uh, as well as being a result of other inequalities. It's a, it's a, uh, a two-way street there. Uh, the fact that we gather data on wealth inequality, but we do not cover it within the MPF seems a glaring omission, and we really want to see that changed. Um, and we do have slight concerns over the, over the uh, incongruity of, of the wording around economic growth within this framework, given it's supposed to be a well-being framework, and, and the indicators that we select to define economic growth uh, are really important. Without disaggregating GDP as a measure, we risk uh, seeing economic growth uh, without nuance and seeing growth in some sectors that we really don't need to grow and having impacts, particularly gender inequality impacts, but other inequalities as well, won't be recognized within that. So we really need to think about how we use GDP as a measure. Not that it's not important, it's that we need to, we need to have more, a more nuanced understanding of what aspects of GDP growth are good and what aspects are bad. Uh, thanks. Okay, that was great. Thanks, convener. Thank you. We now have questions from Tess White, please. Thank you, convener. Um, so I, my question's really directed at Catherine and Catherine. So, um, and Catherine Murphy first. So, and gender raised disappointment that um, the thematic gender review didn't cover intersectional data. And I know Catherine Robertson has just also referred to that point. And it only used available sex at, uh, disaggregated data. So firstly, can I ask Catherine and uh, Murphy and then Catherine Robertson to elaborate upon that. Can you expand on this by explaining just how the Scottish Government might have approached this differently and the data sources it might have used? Yeah, absolutely. So just to, to say, uh, I, I would encourage the committee to find out we could be wrong in that assumption that there, there was, a, I, I suspect we're not, but we could be. We asked at the meeting that was held in June, the gender meeting on the outcomes framework, we asked if they were using intersectional data and they said that they, it was, they only really had access to sex disaggregated. However, that might have changed subsequently. So I would encourage um, the committee, if you're going to speak to the government about that specific review, to ask them a bit more about that for a bit more detail. However, the, the wider, I can certainly speak to the wider challenge so um, we, you know, in some instances, we, we, we generally tend to do not too badly on sex disaggregated data, although there are definite gaps. But the, the problem is that that only tells us a, a very small part of the picture. So to mention something that Lewis has, has just mentioned around homelessness um, or, you know, housing situation, if you just have a very straight reading of homeless figures on the basis of sex disaggregated, uh, it would tell you uh, that 
uh, you know, it would vastly underestimate women's experiences of homelessness because we know that women experience homelessness different to men. So women don't tend to sleep rough. They don't tend to, you know, they, they tend to experience homelessness in quite a different way. So they, they stay with family, etc., and avoid at all costs rough sleeping, for example. So women are vastly under um, accounted for in homelessness statistics. So what we really need is sex disaggregated, but you also need a gendered understanding of the data. So if you take a gendered understanding to homelessness figures, you soon realise that just looking at men and women's, you know, men and women, just counting men and women essentially doesn't tell you everything you need to know. So you need to layer in a gendered analysis. But then that in itself does not tell you what the specific experience of minoritized women are. So what are the specific experiences of black minority ethnic women? What are the specific experiences of LGBT or disabled women? So we know that these are major gaps in, in, in data at the moment. The Scottish government to their credit, is trying through various different kind of uh, equalities data initiatives to move things forward. But we don't think that the that the that it's enough. That it's been invested. There's been enough investment in it. Um, I, I think the scale of the challenge has been significantly underestimated or dismissed. I think we need to invest much more in it. We need to also understand that it's not just a nice cherry on top of the cake in terms of decision making it's the it's a fundamental part of how you build policy because if you don't build policy to meet the needs of the most marginalized your policy will fail ultimately so i think that's uh there is major challenges in terms of intersectional data um gendered data we do have some sex disaggregated data um, and what I would say, what we would say, I mean, I'm not a data analyst. I, I realise that it is, it is a challenge. It's certainly a challenge to really update all our data systems. However, with the technology that that is available, it's hard to see how we can't move things forward quite significantly in the next decade. But to speak to also a point that Lewis raised, there are other data sources. Uh, there is also other forms of information. So there's qualitative data. There's work that's been done in the voluntary sector. There's lived experience data, and also there's just having the the gender competence to understand that if you're just looking at sex disaggregated data is probably not telling you the whole story so you need to go and get some more research and there's lots of different kind of academic voluntary sector etc research in robertson because you've just referred to that yeah. i don't think i could add anything other than what Catherine said i think she summed it up perfectly all the points that we would say great as well. thank you so just a follow-up um can you expand on this by explaining how the Scottish Government might have, um, sorry, in, in terms of the, how it, how it appro could have approached it differently in relation to the terminology. So, um, so terminology, because we've talked about both quantitative and qualitative. So in relation the, to the qualitative, um, could you um, just uh, outline how in your view, and if we start off with Catherine Murphy, how the term sex, gender, and gender identity should be defined, because the, the, the devil is in the detail, and applied in the context of the National Performance Framework. So Catherine Murphy, if you could have a go at starting off with that. I mean, from a, I think that primarily we need to, I mean, I, in terms of how the, the data is collected on the specifics, we need to kind of have a more comprehensive discussion and have a more comprehensive direction around what data is relevant. So we need intersectional data, we need gendered data, we need sex disaggregated data. Uh, we also need uh, um, data that cross-references black minority ethnic women's experiences, LGBT women's experiences. There's a whole host of things that we need to look at in relation to how indicators are measured, how data is collected. So I think there's a lot that could be done, but that, there's a lot of work to be done in that area. We're talking about the qualitative, and so we, you're saying a lot more work needs to be done on those, I mean, they're basically fields in data collection yeah. that need to be defined. So Catherine, do you have a view on that? Um, I think this, in terms of uh, data collection, it's outside of my area of expertise to be able to comment on it. I can give a comment on why it's necessary. Um, no, that's not the question. I suppose the question was in terms of 
how the term should be defined. But what Catherine Murphy has said is basically a lot more work needs to be done. Lewis, would you concur with that? More work needs to be done. I would concur with what Catherine says, and we don't take a view on the, on, on the other you. part thank, of the question. Thank you, convener. Okay, thank you. Now move on to questions from Marie McNair, please. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Uh, Lewis, you mentioned in your submission about the need to strengthen the role of the national outcomes within policy and uh, spending decision making. You've touched on this already, but um, is there anything else you want to add to that, or any kind of missed opportunities there maybe? Yeah, I think we touched it. So we've obviously touched on the legislative side of things. I mean, and 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 we're really clear that that, that that's a big blocker here. Um, but I, I think there's also a culture side to things that maybe we've not talked about so much that, you know, the internal mechanisms of government um, and governments, plural, and that goes down to the local authority level, to use the national outcomes maybe has been absent slightly. That's, I, I, that's anecdotal evidence that I, I know from speaking to people within government over, a, over many years. And... Um, to change that requires a change in culture. You know, it, it's really uh, um, welcome the fact that the current First Minister and at the time Deputy First Minister said the MPF is there to measure what matters. I believe that was in the foreword to the consultation two years ago when he was still DFM. Um, and that's exactly what it should do. Um, uh, we have slight concerns that it's been deprioritized. Um, and that we need to push that up, back up the political agenda. And so I sort of turn that back round on, on this committee and others to, to make that happen. Um, we, we've also talked about the indicators and the, the, the fact that um, if we don't scrutinise the ultimate indicators that are published in early 2025, I believe that's still the timeline, then we are doing the framework a disservice as a as a as external partners like ourselves and, and also within Parliament. So that's critical. Um, and the pub ongoing public engagement. So part of the cultural shift, I think, is has to be about the public caring about this framework, and, and I don't think they do. You know, I, I, if I just think of my own personal social network, if I mention the national outcomes to any one of my family members who haven't heard me moaning about them at some point, um, they will go, what's that? Um, the, there is a, uh, a story that I like to tell. A, a friend of mine lives in Finland, and he has a four-year-old daughter, and she knows what the SDGs are. Why? Because they're on the side of buses, um, and they're advertised. And I think we need to sort of think along those lines around our local delivery mechanism for the SDGs. Let's give it, let's give it the focus that it deserves. Thank you. Totally appreciate your comments there, and certainly when we um, compile the report, we'll take that back to the Scottish Government. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to questions from Paul O'Kane, please. Thank you very much, uh, convener, and good morning to the panel. Uh, I suppose just trying to, to maybe tie some of this together, and I know that we've touched on, on some of this already, but I, I'm particularly interested in um, measurable in indicators, I suppose, and timely and robust disaggregated data. So I, I suppose to reflect uh, on how the proposed outcomes would lend themselves to the use of, um, I suppose, measurable indicators. I, I, and if I can ask, perhaps, just rolling into that question, what the witnesses' priorities would be for the Scottish Government's approach to implementation of the revised outcomes, including identifying, I suppose, those indicators? I'm not sure who wants to go first, just because I'm not in the room, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I can certainly talk about prioritisation of uh, in implementation, uh, Paul. Uh, the for us, so that we, as I said earlier, we we welcome the decision from the Scottish Government to develop an implementation uh, plan for the framework. However, it's slightly unclear at this point what that will look like and the level of depth that that will go into. We think an implementation plan for the framework probably falls short of what's required, and we need to think through implementation plans for each national outcome, and that the development of those plans must involve consultation with relevant stakeholders who have a particular uh, area of expertise around that outcome, be it care, be it um, climate action or others. Uh, we think that's a critical first step uh, to be able to then prioritise what is implemented. Um, we also think that as those national indicators, I've mentioned this already, are developed, that they must uh, reflect 
more clearly some of the statutory targets, uh, particularly around things like poverty. We don't see a connection necessarily in what's measured between the national outcome on poverty and the very real and important targets that we have uh, that this Parliament is committed to in the Child Poverty Act. So we'd like to see more of a connection between those as well. Thanks. That's helpful. And do you think that's true, Lewis, across a suite of policy interventions? Obviously, we're going to have a debate this week about climate targets. You know, um, we have these other uh, areas that sit alongside this work. But I suppose, would your view be that, <clears throat> excuse me, the framework has to sit essentially as the kind of centre of that, and then they have these spokes, if you like, that come off it that have to be more yeah. interactive? Yeah, um, in the in the review of the the MPF uh, more broadly at the end of the last five year period, the uh, Finance and Public Administration Committee's report said that the uh, MPF should be the thread upon which all other policies and spending decisions flow from, and we fully agree with that. And I, I liked your analogy of of it being the central cog with spokes coming off, and I think that's really, really, really important. Yes. Thank you. I wonder if anyone else would like to add to that. Yeah, I'll do, I mean, I can just add a little bit to it. So, I mean, I think f for us, it'll be, there's three layers to it, I guess. There would be, we would obviously, as I've said many times, we want, we would really like to see a standalone outcome on gender equality, which would have a number of things in it. Then we think that the, there's a number of very strong emblematic issues for women's equality. So whether that is women's representation in political and public life, anti-discrimination law, violence against women, participation in the labour market and economy, gender pay gap, etc. So there would be we would want to see integrated indicators across a number of areas, so including the economy, etc., housing. We would want uh, there to be gendered indicators across that. And then uh, beyond that, I mean, we're talking about 51% of the population. So it's important that actually it's not just that, that, that there's, there's also a kind of gendered understanding that comes through uh, appropriate data analysis for all of the indicators. So I, I would say there's three levels to it. There's a standalone outcome, um, gendered indicators within uh, certain critical areas, and economy would certainly be one, housing would be another. Uh, but but there, we, there would be quite a few, I would imagine. Um, and we're happy to send more detail on that if the committee would want it. But beyond that, it would be actually having the proper data across all indicators to better understand the differential impacts. Can I just, as well, about um, uh, the need for training and support when it comes to the implementation, when we're talking about from a specifically related to gender equality and, and in violence against women and girls, um, there needs to be support around what what does that mean? Why is it important? And um, we're trying to overcome um, widespread gender inequality, and that unfortunately means that oftentimes it is not given the priority that it needs. And um, so, the part of the implementation needs to be um, demonstrating why why this is important, how um, it can be done, what is people's roles in um, overcoming gender inequality. And um, so, in when it comes to implementation, we definitely need, as we've all said about um, outcomes indicators, but we we'll also need um, training and support to allow that to happen. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. We now have another question from Pam Gossel, please. Thank, thank you, convener. I ju just wanted to go back to the probe on um, a response you just gave earlier on there uh, in relation to talking about that not just recording, obviously, gender women, that if they were made homeless, but also you talked about minority groups, how they would behave. Now, I certainly know I've did quite a lot of work in, in that area. I know that having a female um, probably um, behave differently if she was homeless. Totally understand that, that they may go to relatives, friends, and they won't maybe sleep on the streets. However, in relation to when you're from an ethnic minority, uh, uh, you may behave completely different because it's cultural aspects. So is there anything um, that any three of you that could shed some light on that, that is, there should be more data collected on that, or also um, even alignment with different data sets? Absolutely. I mean, just to go back to like the, I think that the point that Lewis and others, like and Catherine, has made as well is that um, there will be there will be things, as you say, that are 
uh, cultural, that are, uh, there's a, there'll be a whole host of different things that are specific to specific communities. And the, really, probably the only way that you can fully understand that is not just kind of the number crunching side of data, but actually the qualitative research and the, the engagement, the active engagement of communities and the, that kind of lived experience. And again, to go back to a previous point I made also about the inclusion, and that's why we think it's really critical that the outcomes framework has more in it about women's representation and decision making and policy making spaces. So the you know the other part of it is its engagement of communities, its participatory engagement, um, but it's also having people with that diversity of experiences in the room, round the table, making the decisions. Uh, so the fact that that's omitted is to the extent that it is, it's not strong enough. So that would be there's a lot of things that could be done, but representation is one. And then using qualitative data. Um, and then the third thing is competence. So people who are making decisions, makers, the civil service, understanding what they know, but also understanding what they don't know and when they need to go uh, and get further information to be able to make a, a, a much more kind of informed decision. If that, if that answers your question. No, it does. Catherine, do you want to add something? And Lewis, probably you may want to add something about I can give the cultural aspect of uh, uh, that equality of a um, cultural or a, a woman from an ethnic minority going to get a job. It may not be the same as somebody from the Western society going for that job, because there can be cultural differences, what you can and can't do. So I just wanted to hear from Lewis and Catherine um, if there's anything they want to add. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I fully agree. And from Oxfam's perspective, uh, the intersectionality between racial inequality and gender inequality is is one of our one of our primary drivers of our work globally. We see in repeat, not just in Scotland, everywhere in the world, if you are from an ethnic minority within that community and you are female, things are more difficult statistically and in reality for the vast majority of individuals as well. Um, and collecting data that ensures that desegregation, but also that intersectionality, is so vital in the context of the national performance framework. Um, you know, one of the one of the big issues on poverty data right now is that we we, we have a shocking statistic around ethnic minorities in this country on on, pover on the poverty rate. Shocking, 51 percent. And one of the uh, one of the one of the one of the things that stops that being addressed is the lack of quality data on ethnic minorities. We hear from statistical teams that uh, that data can't be trusted, it might be more, it might be less, there's, there, there's caveats to that statistic. But it doesn't change the fact that it's consistently gone up every year since we've been collecting that data. It is a big, big problem and we uh, implore uh, this committee, the parliament and the government to do something about it. Thank you. Catherine, do you want to add anything? I'll just add a, a wee note in as well about um, capacity um, when it comes to support services to have the time, energy, resources to um, put into their training when it comes to um, supporting their staff to be able to engage um, with um, ethnic minority groups and uh, groups of all kinds to be able to have the time to do that because we know that our public services are very, very stretched at the moment so there needs to be... Um, attention given to that as well to uh, allow for um, more um, training and um, for more yeah I think that's yeah I think that's all I had to add about that thank you thank you convener okay. thank you um, can I just ask does any other members have any other questions I'd like to ask before we come to a close okay that concludes our first panel and um, thank you very much again for joining us this morning we'll now suspend briefly until we get our other witnesses in. Thank you.
Welcome back. We will now move on to our second panel and I welcome to the meeting Dr Alison Jose, Research Officer from the Scottish Human Rights Commission and Sarah Cowan, Coordinator for the Scottish Women's Budget Group, who is joining us remotely. Thank you both for joining us today. Can I ask you both to make an opening statement and I'll start with Dr Alison Jose, please. Thank you, Vener and committee members for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, as the convener said, my name is Alison Hosey and I'm the research officer at the Scottish Human Rights Commission. And part of my work centres on embedding human rights within Scotland's budgetary processes to ensure accountability, um, transparency and public participation, and that to ensure budgetary decisions actively support the realisation of people's rights. Through our involvement in the Equality and Human Rights Budget Advisory Group, we also support the improvement um, and holding government to account for their budgetary processes to ensure that human rights and equalities impacts are at the centre of policy and resource decision making in Scotland. I um, will no doubt move on later to talk about the, the open, recent, um, open Budget Survey, um, which has shown that while Scotland has made improvements in their budget processes, there's still a lot of critical transparency gaps that exist, particularly around the timely release and, in some cases, availability um, of certain budgetary information, and also about comprehensive equality and human rights impact assessments. And without these, public engagement and scrutiny um, remain limited, and the opportunities to protect the rights of the most vulnerable are missed. In addition, um, our focus on trying to encourage better connections between fiscal decisions and Scotland's national outcomes is another key area of, of our work. And we believe that to, key to achieving true budget coherence, the national outcomes need to serve as a guidepost to national priorities and ensuring that every fiscal decision actively contributes to delivering on those outcomes and delivering on Scotland's human rights commitments. So while Scotland's made a lot of positive strides, much more is needed, which I'm sure we'll come on to talk about today. Um, and we are committed to, to continue to highlight these gaps and also you know, act in our advisory role, providing oversight as well. So I appreciate the, the committee's attention to these critical areas and I look forward to discussing more today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll now move on to opening statement from Sarah Cowan, please. Thank you. Um, as has been said, my name is Sarah Cowan. I'm the coordinator for the Scottish Women's Budget Group. Thank you for inviting us to give evidence today. Um, as you'll be aware from previous evidence sessions, um, the Scottish Women's Budget Group works to provide um, works towards gender equality through gender budgeting, and we advocate for its use at all use at all levels of government and across public bodies. Um, we welcome the opportunity to give evidence um, to this committee and the choice of the committee to focus on the Equality and Human Rights Budget Advisory Group recommendations, work to make the budget more transparent, and how gender budgeting can be progressed in government. It's really important to see committee scrutiny doubling down on this as well. Um, and in taking the multi-year approach to the scrutiny process that's underway um, from this committee. Um, in January, we shared our views um, with this committee on, our, on the draft budget, and through that we talked about key tenants in gender budgeting of transparency, participation, outcome focused, and advancing equality. Um, and it seems like good synergy with the focus of today's evidence and, and the, the areas we would be, will be discussing in today's session. Um, but as, as a the Scottish Women's Budget Group is also an external member of the Equality and Human Rights um, Budget Advisory Group, um, and so are, are able to share kind of our thoughts and reflections on on discussions that have been taking place um, within relating to the recommendations the group made. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to questions from members. And I'd like to ask the first question. Last year, the committee heard that the EFBS and other equalities documents accompanying the budget should be made more prominent. How do you see an increased volume of information available being presented accessibly? And are there any documents or content that you feel are superfluous? I would ask Dr. Jose first, please. Thanks very much. The I mean, transparency and accessibility are essential to, to rights-based budgeting, and accessible information allows people to understand and engage with the fiscal decisions, builds trust with government and government processes, and when the public can interact meaningfully with budget documents, it, it strengthens accountability and it reinforces the, that fiscal decisions are subject to scrutiny. Um, I mentioned that the OBS and the, the transparency score that we saw for Scotland had risen from 41 to 60 out of 100, 
but key documents such as the pre-budget statement and in-year reports are still not available to the public. Now, the pre-budget statement doesn't exist and the in-year reports are made internally in the Scottish Government, but they're not made publicly available. And arguably, decisions that are made in-year are as important in terms of their impact on human rights as those that are made in the main budgetary document. And the impact assessment, for example, when you talk about other documents, the impact assessment that was done on the recent fiscal decisions that were made, um, it's now been published after the fact, so it wasn't there to inform decisions for publicly, but um, we have now seen um, what the decisions were based on. And they lack the necessary depth to fully capture any human rights implications. Um, to give a couple of examples, they, they mention about mental health and assessment of mental health cuts. And they suggest that vulnerable groups may be dis disproportionately impacted by um, the cuts. But there's no specific detail on the potential impacts that these may be. And there's no mitigation strategies put in place. Um, and we'd argue, actually, that th those cuts potentially have a significant negative impact, and as it leaves those that rely on those services insignificantly protected or insufficiently protected, and it restricts informed public scrutiny. Another example in terms of active and sustainable travel funding, um, here the impact assessment noted possible consequences for low-income families or individuals, but Again, it lacked clarity on how these cuts could affect people. For example, um, their access to essential services or job opportunities as a result of those cuts. And without that kind of thorough analysis um, of how such cuts affect specific rights, like the right to work or the right to an adequate standard of living, these assessments fall short um, in terms of transparency and the precision that's required for rights-based um, budgeting. But a broader view of the, those kind of impact assessments reveals a tendency towards surface level conclusions of no impact with no real clarification um, or you know, substantiating those comments. These assessments really fall short of the transparency standards that we need um, for effective rights-based budgeting. And as I mentioned before, this, the, the in-year spending adjustments are often as impactful on human rights as the, the main budget. Um, and they're rarely documented and leaving little um, oversight um, of, or insight to their impact. But improving accessibility and data quality, um, we suggest three particular measures. The impact assessments need to be rigorous, especially for vulnerable populations. We need to use real life examples and show the impact of how cuts would have been or would better highlight human consequences. Um, we need a more systematic approach to data collection analysis, analysis aligned with what's required for thorough impact assessments. And finally, more timely and public friendly documents. Um, we did see the citizens budget reappear, the year Scotland, year finance. That is a really useful document at presenting budget data in an accessible way, but it was presented as the budget document. So after decisions are already made, you need something like that at every stage that budget documents are, are published. So MTFS, if there are in-year reports, any pre-budget statements so that they can help to inform discussion rather than just this is the sort of fait accompli in terms of the budget. Um, and just lastly, the, the accessible and comprehensive budget information, you know, it is fundamental for making human rights based public finance decisions. And we stand still ready to collaborate with Scottish Government to, to help ensure that the, the budget process can become more inclusive and clear and aligned with human rights based principles. Thank you. Sarah Cowan, please. Thank you, and I, I completely agree with Alison's points, and I'm going to hit some of the same markers as, as she has and maybe build on them from the, the gender perspective. Um, as Alison said, the main publication at the time of budget, um, Your Scotland, Your Finances, is, is a welcome piece and important for, for outlining the, the draft budget when it's published, but it doesn't support participation um, in the pre-budget scrutiny process. Um, and about, in terms of who... Um, ensuring that information is accessible. It, um, it's about also getting that information out um, rather than as well as publishing it, but making sure it can reach people um, through, through different communication channels so that people are aware it exists um, and can take a look um, if they're, when they're interested. Um, so in terms of the pre-budget scrutiny um, process and information that's available, um, that remains uh, largely kind of inaccessible and more for um more likely for organizations like ourselves to to be 
be looking through. So while any, anyone can submit evidence in, in pre-budget committee stage, um, in, in reality, it's unlikely for people facing the, harsh, the sharpest end of um, economic inequality inequality. This year, the Scottish Women's Budget Group worked with a group of women to contribute to the Finance and Public Administration Committee's consultation. Um, and this group of consisted of women from the Glasgow Disability Alliance Women's Group um, and women who had been involved in research uh, with Glasgow University as part of a multiple located employment piece of research. This group of women um, will be in Parliament tomorrow as well. Um, hopefully you've received an email about that. Um, but when we were talking to them, when my colleague was talking to them about uh, the pre-budget scrutiny process and, and, and the budget more widely, the, there were some key questions that they, they wanted to ask um, around how do people find out about opportunities to participate because they hadn't heard of them before. Um, and they do, do the current methods um, of reaching out to people, target mainly those who have participated in the past, or do they look to expand this? And, um, and uh, with the makeup of the group, they were particularly interested in how disabled women's views um, were, were sought. And, but also wanting to be clear on what difference does it make to, to provide their views and how can their views make a difference um, in the participation process? Because there was some lack of lack of trust potentially in the system and of whether the scrutiny process can really uh, change things and how people can then find out about about that um, afterwards and how the scrutiny process has influenced um, uh, the, the budgeting process. Um, there was also a feeling from the group that uh, in terms of information accessibility, there was a feeling from the group that um, with announcements, there is always going to be the the political spin on the budget and the, the the painting it in a positive picture from one side and and maybe trying to paint it in a more negative picture from the other side, um, and so it, it can be hard to then work out what's actually what's actually been agreed and what does this actually mean for the spending. So that's why non-party political publications are needed and and the role of committees is so important in getting some of that information out there. Um, I agree. Uh, with Al uh, Alison's points around some of other, the other information that, that's needed as well, and that was part of the Equality and Human Rights Budget Advisory Group um, recommendations um, that there should be a pre-budget statement, and that this in itself would help make clearer information for the public about what the parameters are, um, the kind of economic forecast and anticipated revenue and expenditures. Um, so there could be an accessible version of that sort of pre-budget statement as well. Um, as Alison has referenced, I, I was looking at the other information that's available and with the in-year um, review that took place and the, the emergency changes that took place this year, um, the the EQIA was published slightly after the facts. And, and again, um, for it to be as transparent as possible, it would be best for this to be trans um, published at the same time. Um, I'll try and avoid repeating some areas, um, just to say that um, when looking at the EQIA, we had also pulled out the mental health funding um, as an area um, around how the how information is used um, uh, to the same points that Alison has has highlighted. Another example would be around social social care, and um, so we we see across all all a lot of the areas within the EQIA a failure to for to show the working and what has been um and what has been set out. So within the the social care uh, reductions, uh, that happened again. So there was a failure. It says that the multidisciplinary service teams um will be maintained at the previous year's level rather than the intended increase. But it doesn't give us the information about if the previous year's level was enough. Um, if the additional funding had been put in place because there was additional supply needed. Um, and so we'd be looking to understand the impact of not having that additional funding, because obviously it had been, we presume it had been put there for, for a reason. Um, and uh, we'd want to see what difference it makes in not allocating those additional funding. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there on this question. Oh, thank you both. That was uh, really helpful. Thank you for that. We'll now move on to questions from Maggie Chapman, please. 
Thanks very much, Convener, and, and good morning to, to you both. Thank you for joining us this morning, and I'm sorry I'm not in, in the room with you. Um, my question really follows on, on from that. Uh, we, we know that a couple of years ago, the Scottish Government committed to a very, very clear approach linking policy development more effectively with budget decisions and, and vice versa, and longer-term financial planning, and that the most effective place to ensure that lived experience views were considered was that portfolio whilst the po policies were being developed rather than than after the, after the fact and I, I suppose Alison if I can come to you first in uh, do you get a sense that there's actually been that that recognition that um, policy development and budget decisions are better linked you know that that's one of airbags recommendations and I, I suppose they, they've been there have been challenges that you both have outlined, uh, outlined. but but Alison, I wonder if, if you could say just a little bit more about how you think the Scottish Government is making progress on, on those commitments. Sure. Um, I mean, our role within the Equality and Human Rights Budget Advisory Group, same as Sarah, is it involves providing oversight and expertise and advice to the, the Scottish Government about how to better align the budgets with, um, in our case, human rights obligations, but also equalities obligations. And... Um, the responsibility for implementing these recommendations obviously ultimately lies with the Scottish Government. But our contribution has focused on trying to enhance, enhance that transparency and embedding human rights into budget processes and making those impact assessments more accessible. We, we have seen improvements. We have seen significant improvements in, in the, the government's um, willingness to listen to the advice of the, of the advisory group uh, to really take on board trying to make incremental improvements to the um, EFSBS. There's going to be so many acronyms today, for which I apologise. But the, the, um, the equality statement, effectively. And there have been lots of different iterations in trying to look at how best to, to utilise that information and to present it and to make it coherent with policy decisions. But I think my, my biggest um, issue still remains is that the, the EFSBS, it comes out at the time that the... You know, the, the, the when the budget decisions are already made. So we don't get that information in advance in terms of it being impact assessments. It doesn't, it doesn't inform public to have a discussion around what budgetary decisions need to be made or to, to have any kind of impact on the budgetary decisions which effectively are, are pretty much made by that point. And we don't really get a sense of what, um, what information has fed into those decisions. So I think that the, the same criticism about the, the, um, the emergency financial um, changes, the, the information is quite scant in terms of no impact or limited impact without really going into depth as to how those clarifications came about, how those decisions were made or decisions were reached. Um, I still think there's a lack of um, understanding which comes with a lack of capacity building at this point around what human rights impacts actually are and what the obligations of government with regards to all of the individual rights um, are and therefore how they, how they should be reflected within those decisions. So I think there, there is progress has been made, there are, there's definitely effort, um, a lot of effort going in from, from government officials, but I think there's still a limited understanding and that capacity building needs to develop further across all portfolio areas so that there's um, a better understanding and also to come from above uh, um, a willingness to put the resource and time for staff to, to be built in terms of capacity. This has to come from um, higher up in terms of a commitment to actually seeing understanding equality and human rights impacts as central to policy development, not as something that you think about afterwards to just check if it's okay. No, no, th thanks for that, Alison. And, and uh, I suppose, can we take from what you said there? So what, one of the uh, things that the Scottish Government committed to do for, for the, this coming year's uh, budget was was exactly that awareness raising of of the um, EFSBS, but also that that, that process of um, making making budget decisions really geared towards tackling inequality. And given given what you say about the impact assessments as well, do you fear or or, or do you, are you concerned that the um, impact assessments improvement program won't unless it tackles that time scale of actually doing the work before decisions are made we're not going to see we're not going to see the the, the benefits of, of of that that information that that we should yeah i think i think there's a long way to go and i think that um, there needs 
to also be the, the different time points at which we look at impact, that it's not just these are the potential impacts of these policies or these budgetary decisions, but further down the line, what impact did they have? Did they have the intended impact? Were there unintended impacts? And to really scrutinise those impacts from both before and after so that you have a real sense of what needs to be taken forward in future for progress. Thanks, Alison. Sarah, if I can come to you with a similar kind of question around um, how where, where, where progress, progress is on, on the specific recommendations around um, impact assessments uh, around awareness raising that the, those issues. Yeah, and I suppose for some of it, it's going to be hard to to say until we see the outcomes that of this year, year's kind of uh, EFSBS, um, because some of those uh, particularly training programs have been underway. Um, this year, as, as I understand it. I think one thing, um, just adding on to what Alison has said, is that, um, and, and it has happened uh, maybe, I think, a, a couple of years ago, a couple of portfolios did put more information in, into the EFB, SBS um, of the equality impact assessments that had been carried out throughout the policymaking process. So they linked the information uh, there um, back into the EFBS um details but that was more uh the oh, um it was one or two rather than the norm so that kind of if if the work is taking place at um through the policy making process and and um at, at different points in the year then it can be easily linked in and and as um as has been said we, we need to see the process as, as a circular kind of process that that's ongoing through the budget process and after it um I think that um, on top of that, um, we'd be hoping to see um, in this year's in this year's EFSBS greater linkages being made to um, to other points, so particularly to the national outcomes um, and how work uh, in, on the different portfolio areas is linking in to delivering the national outcomes and how assessment is made to. The, um, to the budget spend, linking back to that, um, and and again also to the program for government, so that these all these pieces are all linking together, and the the quality work that goes into them is a com a culmination um, through all the different pieces as well. So that it's not um, it's not one thing just to get it done for the budget, but it's in, um, to help the, and support the decision making processes. Th thanks, Erin. And that very much chimes with some of the evidence we, we heard last year in, in, in our in, in our budget at work around around policy coherence. And we, we've heard that this, from, from the earlier panel this morning as well. I, I suppose just your 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 reflections. Do you think there is the understanding of the importance of that? coherence work uh, across the piece and impacts that, you know, you, we, we talked about, well, you, you, you talked about shorter, but also longer term impacts, unforeseen uh, consequences. Do you think there is that understanding of how, how things do work together? And do the, do the outcomes, national outcomes, pr perhaps provide a framework where we can actually start looking at whole picture things rather than rather than the silos and and sort of compartmentalized um decision making that that we've seen yeah i mean i certainly think the national performance framework should act as that framework to mm -hmm. to take the the bigger and broader picture and i think um in terms of the work that's been done um more recently based on the recommendations made by um airbag um as it was just one thing to say on those recommendations, they were made by the group back in um, 2021, but the Scottish government's response came in 2023. So we're kind of looking at a year's worth of action on them instead of yeah. what we'd have we'd have hoped to be looking at three years worth. Um, I think steps have been taken over this year um, to to try and look at that that broader piece though and and the connections. And um, we, uh, uh, as part of the group, we do hear back from some senior leaders within government, particularly the director of Exchequer and the director of the equalities um, and mainstreaming unit um, to, to update us on progress being made on issues that do relate to, to this um, and on, in particular to kind of the the cumulative piece um, and that is from our point of view it is really important that that is that there is work done to look across portfolios um, because it's very easy for things to be siloed and um, 
that is what you what you often see. Um, so there needs to be the bigger picture taken um, so that you, particularly in a time of constrained finances where there's maybe going to be multiple areas that are um, are reducing budgets, where the cumulative impact of those reductions could be hit. Um, so we'd be very worried that they, they would hit multiple actions would be hitting the most marginalised groups. Um, so I think steps have been taken, but I wouldn't go, I would say steps. Um, and it's it's definitely something that needs a lot of focus and attention to make sure there is that broader um, outlook. So that, especially in this constrained finance position. Thank, thanks, Sarah. That, Alison, do you want to come back in on that? Quickly? Yeah, I think the MPF is something that I've been involved with since 2011 thereabouts so I've got a kind of long institutional memory of all the different things and right from the start I've always said I think the MPF has got such transformational potential that it's it's just been untapped since its its creation and I think it's a I don't think that there's a lack of awareness of silos and the way that the government works um, I think there is an overwhelm perhaps at just what a big job that it would be to break away from that siloed way of working. And I think it, it would be a, a big task, but there have been you know, pilot areas that we've heard about in Airbag um, in relation to things like development of childcare. And we, you know, we, we've seen how that potential to develop a policy to answer um, particular issues has been developed across portfolios. And the, the potential is there. But I think that the MPF, the National Outcomes, um, you know, they provide a val potentially valuable framework for aligning fiscal policy with Scotland's overarching goals um, and including human rights and equality. And the revised outcomes provide um, potentially a clear basis for connecting budget decisions to our long term vision for Scotland. But something that I've said over the last six years um, in a number of different areas of evidence is what we need is not confined to the national outcomes. What's required is attention to in the entirety of the government's planning. So as the last session said as well, from the programme for government to the MPF, the, the MTFS, the EFSBS, as many acronyms as you can fit in a sentence, there is a lack of policy coherence and a desperate need for a whole government approach. Um, and I think if the, the MPF, if it's, our, if it's genuinely our statement of our nation's ambition, then the programme for government as our annual statement of policy intent and policy priorities needs to be created as a means to deliver on the national outcomes. And the MTFS and the annual budgetary allocation and spend process has to reflect those priorities. So that you can see where the, the nice, neat connections have the potential to be. Uh, we're not there yet. But I think that's, that's, where, we're, that's where we want to see things go. Great. Th th thanks both. I'll, I'll leave it there, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to questions from Pam Gosal, please. Thank, thank you, convener, and thank you very much, and good morning, panel, for all the evidence you've provided so far. Uh, my question kind of leads on from the previous questions in relation to have witnesses been given the opportunity to work with the Scottish Government on the improvements that the committee heard uh, would strengthen the equality and fairer Scotland statement? Yeah. Um, I mean, the EFSBS is intended to, to assess and communicate the equality and human rights impacts of the budget um, and budget decisions and guide fiscal policy so that we, uh, the outcome is fair and inclusive outcomes for Scotland. Um, our contributions are focused on enhancing the EFBS by advocating for greater transparency, greater depth and relevance in the analysis, as we mentioned before. Um, our involvement in Airbag has been consistent. Um, we have worked closely in that role to promote human rights budgeting principles um, and but processes as well. Um, and for example, our, our collaboration with the, the Open Budget Survey has been productive. So through um, the Equality and Human Rights Budget Advisory Group and also through the, the Open Government Partnership, um, we have connected with Exchequer officials showing a strong commitment to improving transparency and improving the EFSBS. Um, we are Extending the human rights focus approach, though, across all government departments remains a challenge. There's currently no department that systematically practices human rights budgeting. Um, the expertise in rights analysis, as I mentioned before, I think is still missing, um, and it's yet to be Im embedded in sort of policy development and, and resource allocation. So that's a gap that we've repeatedly highlighted through Airbag and, and as the Commission as well. Um, and 
we need to see, or we were hoping to see more of that capacity building through the process of the implementation of the Human Rights Bill. As that stands, we don't know where that stands. Um, but in terms of enhancing the, the FSBS, particularly um, our contributions with um, government have focused on trying to improve comprehensive impact analysis, um, aligning better alignment with the national outcomes and looking at issues around accessibility and public engagement. And for me, um, I think, as I mentioned before, that uh, my major issue with the um, progress is that the EFSBS still presents that kind of retrospective picture um, of the potential impacts rather than actually looking um, at actively informing the, the budgetary decisions that, that need to be made. So we, we are involved and we're, we're, we're working collaboratively with um, the Scottish Government to improve that, um, but ultimately implementing those changes and improvements you know, lies with them. Thank you. Sarah, do you want to say anything on about um, have you had a chance to have that opportunity? Um, well, likewise, we've shared our, our analysis and our, our, on, on last year's um, AFBS and, and have done so um, many years in the past, um, but particularly drawing out where we think um, improvements can be made or, or what we think are, are key elements that can be built on for, for the future, um, for the next version of the EFSBS. Um, again, in our role um, on the EARBAG, um, we heard from the team who were leading the review of um, the EFSBS and, and what their plans are for, for this year. Um, who did mention kind of the, the need to for alignment with programme for government and national outcomes. So we... Um, we will need to wait and see till, till the publication with the draft budget um, what, what this looks like and what difference that has made. Um, but again, as Alison has said, the important thing about the... It's important to have the equality statement, um, to have that statement alongside the budget, but it is vital that, that the work in, in, in producing it is informing decisions rather than being produced um, just as a, a statement after the fact. So it, the, the importance around this is that it's being used to help inform the decisions. And one thing we did hear um, in your bag was that um, work on it started earlier this year. So in that sense, maybe we will see some um, some uh, outcomes that, that we can see where, where it has helped inform decisions, but it has to be part of the, the, the circular process that I mentioned um, in the last answer to, to really help um, inform decision making. Thank you. Um, I've got a supplementary question with that as well. The Scottish um, Women's Budget Group have suggested that a gender budgeting approach should consider the life, uh, lifetime impact of policy and spending decisions. To what extent does the current data availability support this aspiration? I think that would be yourself, Sarah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely, and I, I caught the end of the, the last session, there's definitely a, a need for data improvement. Um, and we support the, the comments that were being made in the last panel about the need to, to improve, um, improve data. But that shouldn't be a barrier to starting the analysis on considering kind of this lifetime impact of a policy. So what we mean by that is how it would impact women at different stages in their life, um, decisions that, that are being made and how a decision, a spending decision now on, on childcare, for example, could then impact on, um, on women's kind of poverty in later life. Um, so I think what's important is that um, analysis on this can um, start start to take place. That in itself will highlight where there's data gaps um, and what more information is needed. Um, but as you were hearing in the last panel, there's the need for the quantitative data, but there also could be the qualitative pieces that can be used um, to support that and work that's being done across different sectors that, that could be used to support the analysis. Um, we've long called for better collection, analysis and publication of gender sensitive sex disaggregated data across all policy areas. Um, and I think what's key within that, and again, that I heard from the, the last panel saying is the use of intersectional data uh, in the analysis. And we do see that um, as missing in some of the current um, analysis that's taking place within um, the publications, both in the recent one for the in-year changes and in the EFBS, that often the analysis looks at, at the protected characteristics in silos and highlights um, the issues for the groups individually, rather than taking that intersectional piece. So 
So alongside um, us considering the lifetime impact of policy and spending decisions, it's that that connects into the intersectional um, analysis as well. Thank you, Sarah. I just wanted to ask you something that I asked um, the other panel. I don't know if you got the, the question at the end in relation to, you know, you spoke about a woman's different times in uh, their life. But what about the cultural aspect, obviously, and ethnic minority groups? That how does it affect them? Is there anything you want to see, any work around that that needs to be enhanced? Or um, we did hear that uh, poverty was, I think, around about 51 per cent around ethnic minority groups. So um, is there any work that we could strengthen to do on that or any advice from yourself? Um, I, I think that it's really important to look at the... the um, so from our perspective of taking it from a women's perspective, looking at the experiences of ethnic minority women in particular, we see through research that... that that we do in our women's survey that those um, who've um, come from ethnic minority backgrounds are often saying they're struggling more with, for example, food and energy prices. Uh, we similarly see for disabled women um, and single parent households, all these groups of women are struggling to a greater extent with, with rising costs, for example. So it's really important that times, that's why the, the kind of intersectional uh, analysis is so important to see um, what different groups of women are experiencing. And um, ideally, you'd want then to look at, at support to um, and the policies that will support those who are struggling the most um, and, and focus the efforts that, in that way. Thank you. I don't know if Dr. Alison, sorry, wanted to say anything on that. No, I completely agree with Sarah. I think that, um, you know, in, in terms of um, gender budgeting as a powerful tool for addressing inequalities and promoting a fairer, more inclusive society, that, but gender budgeting, um, to be fully effective, it has to be grounded in that accessible, high-quality data that we've been talking about to guide decisions and monitor outcomes effectively. Um, I think advancing those goals requires the investment that the last panel talked about in terms of data collection infrastructure, um, developing a, a robust data infrastructure to, you know, it's essential to support gender budgeting and other rights-based budgeting efforts. Um, and embedding gender budgeting as a core fiscal policy principle, um, making that a mandated component of Scotland's fiscal processes would also help to ensure that all departments consider gender and gendered impacts in their budgetary decisions and in aligning with Scotland's obligations to respect, protect and fulfil um, human rights. Clear guidance from leadership, I think, is essential to reinforce that gender equality and human rights are, are non-negotiable aspects of Scotland's budgeting framework. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. We'll now move on to questions from Marie McNair, please. Uh, thank you, Convener, uh, and good morning, panel. What I was going to cover, I think, um, has already been spoken about, is collaborative working. So I think um, Dr. Hosey had covered that, so I'm actually okay. Thank you. We'll now move on to Evelyn Tweed, please. Thanks, Convener, and uh, good morning, panel, and thanks for, sorry, I should say good afternoon now, panel, and thanks for all your answers so far. Um, my question is about the equality evidence strategy. Uh, do members feel that this strategy is delivering change at an effective pace? And Dr. Jose, you'll sure, I can start so. with that. Um, I mean, we see the, the equality, equality evidence strategy um, as promoting or promising, um, you know, as a promising initiative for advancing equality in Scotland, um, particularly through its focus on addressing data gaps um, that have long limited our ability to assess equality impacts fully. Um, I recently discussed this strategy's progress with my counterpart at the Equality and Human Rights Commission because we, as part of an, an advisory group um, on the Equality Data Improvement Programme, um, I was on annual leave during the last meeting, but she updated me on uh, where, where we got to in the, that assessment. And she said that um, we understand that the interim report on the Equality Evidence Strategy is scheduled for a release uh, before the new year. And that report is intended to outline the progress made against the initial timeline. So we should have a clearer picture then with regards to whether or not we're progressing at the right, at the right pace to deliver meaningful change. But they, there's a series of highlight reports that have been published quarterly, and they offer a quantifiable measure of short-term progress. Um, they highlight, uh, the highlight reports are uh, they're available publicly on the government's website, and they summarise overall achievements towards the strategy objectives as they stand. Um, the reports indicate that the equality evidence strategy is moving forward as planned, but it's challenging to measure long-term impacts at this stage. Um, the strategy's ultimate success in delivering change will depend very much on consistent progress across several years. 
especially in building robust disaggregated data infrastructure um, that's foundational to the, the evidence base equality driven policy. Um, I think there's a couple of things that we need to ensure that effective peace is maintained and that is prioritising data collection on key equality metrics. So building a data infrastructure that can support rights based decision or budgeting decision making. Um, it requires prioritising data collection in the areas that most directly impact equality outcomes. And these include metrics on gender and race and disability and other interest, er, intersectional factors. And we also need to commit to regular transparent updates from government. Um, the upcoming interim report and the quarterly highlight reports are positive steps, but we encourage the, the government to ensure that these updates remain um, transparent and accessible to all stakeholders. And um, this will allow civil society as well as policymakers um, and parliament and the public to track progress and identify where there are emerging, and get, um, emerging gaps or any particular delays. So at the moment, um, jury's out, but we should be finding out soon in terms of, of whether or not we're, we're satisfied with the pace of progress. Thank you. Satisfied? Thank you. We'll now move on to questions from... Thank you, convener. My question, Dr. Hosey, was, um, I think has been asked, my question was, do the revised national outcomes lend themselves to greater connection and coherence in a budget setting context? But you have talked about the transformational potential and the lack of uh, policy coherence. And we've heard from you and, and, and um, Ms. Cowan that, that basically there, there's this sort of silo working. So I'm going to drill down with two questions, one a broad question and then one a, one a more specific question. So if you, if you actually look against the background of, let's say, the 500 million in-year spending cuts announced by the Finance Secretary in September, um, to what extent has the Scottish Government successfully adhered to the three principles of human rights budgeting? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, I, not very well, I think, is a, a general assessment. Um, I think it was done very speedily, um, without much transparency around, at the time, why the decisions were made. And then after the fact, the publication that has been made doesn't provide the level of detail to really give me assurance that the human rights considerations really were a, a strong feature in the decisions, um, whether they'd really examined the extent to which... Um, different groups may be impacted um, adversely by those particular decisions. And if so many impacts in that assessment say no impact, it makes you think, well, why was the funding allocated in the first place? And I don't think that the funding was maybe that was, was not meant to be allocated. So I think that there's a lot of questions there. It's, it wasn't a very satisfactory um, process. It wasn't transparent. Um, I'm not aware of any participation with groups that may be affected by the decisions um, that were made. Um, and the degree to which they've been held accountable for that um, from wider, I mean, that's partly the committee's jobs um, to be able to do, do a better job of that. There have been questions asked, there's been a lot of public questions asked, but um, it's a, a, an unsatisfactory outcome, I would say. Okay, and then that, the, the next one, and I, this point that you both talked about was about the silo working, and um, I've just come from the health committee and uh, I'm enriched with a lot of um, learning from that. And so, and I come from the northeast of Scotland. So, in the northeast of Scotland, we're seeing, let's say, an increasing level of centralisation in the delivery of healthcare to cut costs and make economies. Um, but that can, uh, when you're looking at the impact assessment of that, that can entrench gender inequality and geographical inequality because services are becoming increasingly accessible. And we've got many examples of people having to travel, let's say, from an outlying area like Forfa to, to Tayside Hospital and Dundee for a IUD, you know, those sorts of things that are gender. People don't think about the cost of travel from a rural area to a major hospital and uh, childcare responsibilities or caring responsibilities that women have. So in your opinion, do you believe there is a disconnect between budget decisions like this, and this I've given the example about healthcare and rural healthcare, and policy outcomes? Yes, undoubtedly. Um, the, we will be publishing later 
we're not into November yet, are we? So next month, um, the outcomes of work that the Commission did last year into um, economic, social and cultural rights experience in the Highlands and Islands. And that is an area which will feature quite strongly. We did see you know, other examples around um, children who had an orthodontic appointment maybe once every six weeks, having to take an entire day off school because of the travel required to go somewhere to have that process um, looked at, and yet that's a whole day of school, and so the educational impacts as well as the cost of travel and a parent having to take a day off work to, to facilitate that. So there was lots of issues around transport um, costs um, which weren't being um, uh, reimbursed fully, um, if at all, um, being a huge barrier to people actually accessing services. Um, I think the, when there's rural proofing, is the, the phrase we often hear about, I don't think does a satisfactory job where policy starts at the central belt and then rural thought about as opposed to thinking about it from the start. So that's the whole looking at human rights and equalities impact being the starting point for, for decisions being made, not something as a checklist afterwards that you might have considered. So I think that's where changing that culture of how we make policy decisions by looking at those impacts as the kind of the centre starting point for decisions is really important. Um, there was another point, though, that we mentioned before um, when we talked about national outcomes and the, the MPF that I didn't want to lose sight of. And, and it was raised in the last um, session as well. And it was about looking at the, the kind of implementation side of things um, and connecting that to budget, which I think is really important. Um, the government has moved away, as Lewis mentioned earlier, from the target aspect of the national performance framework, saying that it was Scotland's framework and therefore it wasn't just the government's responsibility to deliver on those outcomes. And I think that's almost moved the accountability away from government for delivering on the national outcomes. And I think that's something that we need to recapture. And it's, it's something as an organisation that the Commission has been grappling with over the last year to look at how do we show our impact um, in an area that's, that has lots of different actors contributing towards. And that, in a sense, is what the, the National Performance Framework has. We need to see the government set out what their theory of change is. How do they intend to deliver on the aspects of the outcomes that are their responsibility? And that would be the same for local authorities, for public bodies, for you know anybody who is potentially going to help deliver on the national outcomes. And that then helps to transfer across to, well, what evidence do we need to be looking for to actually show progress? And the indicators, as Lewis, Lewis mentioned in the last session, are, you know, they're not fit for purpose as they stand. The human rights ones are, are, are really not fit for purpose. Um, and they don't really tell us a story that is helpful in terms of progress. And I think that I don't know what's going to come out of the, the reassessment of the, the indicators, but we need to be looking at much more kind of cross-cutting indicators and, and a, a matrix of um, indicators in terms of not just the outcomes, but have we got the right structures in place? Have we got the processes and the budgetary aspects in place? And do we have the right, right results? And looking at that kind of triple layer we've always referred to as human rights-based um, indicators, the bit in the middle is the effort. So you're... you're are you putting the right structures in place? Are you then creating the right policies to achieve those outcomes? Are you putting the resources where those policies need them? And what, what's the outcome of that in terms of results? And it's looking at all those different layers so that you can try and work out, are we, are we not putting the right policy in place? Or is the policy not funded enough or in the right way? So you know, rather than just looking at outcomes, result outcomes. So I think all of that as a picture is quite a different way of approaching how we look at measurement for the national performance framework, but it might help with that policy coherence and a way of looking at the different layers that are needed to help achieve them. So, so we're about to go into a budgeting round. What you're saying is it's not been done before. So for us as a committee to set, let's say, for the rubber to hit the road is to, to look at the budget, see where the targets are, see where they do an uh, equality impact assessment and have some very, very clear measured outcomes. That's what you're saying. So what are, we, what are we trying to achieve? How are we setting out to achieve that? How are we funding that? What do we expect to see? And then did we see what we expected? And if not, why not? 
And if you've got all of that information set out, it's easier then to identify why things have perhaps gone right, but not for the reasons you expected, or they've not gone right, and it, make changes. It seems so obvious. I know, it sounds really simple. Like, I know it's, it's so not. obvious. Why haven't we done it before? <laughs> I think because government's a big beast and it's been working in such a siloed way for so long, it is very difficult to break down those barriers and, and budgets are, are protected within different areas and to sort of appreciate where cross-department working can have much more of an impact. It is hard and it, it's a different way of working. It's, a, it's completely different and that does take capacity building and effort and the resources have to go into that capacity building as well and I think that's a gap at the moment. Sarah, before I pass back to the convener, Sarah, do you have any comments to add, anything to say? Um, I just wanted to come back to your initial question about the in-year budget um, change, changes, and I completely agree with the points that Alison have made in terms of the analysis um, that was conducted about that. The point I wanted to add was just that um, we are told that these are emergency in-year budget changes, but they have happened over the last three years. There's had to be some kind of in-year change like that, which is um, talked of in the same sort of emergency urgent language. And once it becomes more than three years in a row, you know, how much more process do we need around it to ensure that the analysis um, really is there and that there can't be the the reasoning couldn't be that there there wasn't time for this, and I think this is uh, an important role for committee and how how that sort of piece is looked at as well. Thank you, thank you, convener. Thank you. We'll now move on to questions from Paul O'Kane, please. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to or good afternoon to the panel. Um, I, I suppose in trying to pull some of this together, because um, we've covered a lot of ground, I, I'm interested to understand. I would prioritise the identification of indicators and data sets to support revised national outcomes. And tied to that, uh, I suppose, a question about should we have a specific national outcome on, on gender inequality, which I, I think we've be, begun to touch upon, but I think it would be useful if we can just uh, pull together uh, thoughts on, on that. Dr. Jose, yeah. Um, I mean, as, as I just mentioned, you know, we've we've long advocated for for human rights based indicators, looking at that tri level, so the, the structure, process, outcome, the commitment, effort, result, and I think the the way that we currently my, my concern about the current indicators is that we've been told in the expert advisory group of which the commission is also a member that um, there is no new resource, so there will be no new income uh, indicators that require resource. And so that fills me with a bit of dread in terms of, you know, the, if the data isn't already collected that we need, that we're not going to get that. But as panellists earlier mentioned, I think there, there's, a, there's a lot of data in Scotland. There's a lot of data collected and, and perhaps looking, you know, a bit more at what we don't need to collect as well as what we could improve in terms of collection and looking at the wide variety of qualities of data, not just at the numbers, as was mentioned quite eloquently in the last panel around um, in, numbers only tell one, one part of the story and that the, the qualitative and lived experience data is so important in being able to assess actual impacts on people's lives. But I think, um, you know, our key priorities in terms of development of indicators is disaggregated equality and human rights indicators, um, indicators that are aligned with better with national outcomes, um, data on access to essential services and social protection. We've spoken to the committee before about minimum outcomes, uh, minimum core obligations rather, and looking at how we potentially develop a way of measuring whether or not Scotland is meeting those obligations. There's a big potential public participation discussion that could happen to really galvanise our understanding about what is acceptable levels of, of service and provision in Scotland and what we could perhaps base our national outcome indicators on. And also on participation and inclusivity in the budget process, I think somebody mentioned earlier around um, participation of um, people within the budget process. And as I said earlier, they, we did some research five years ago on um, people's experiences of working, um, giving evidence to the committee, either oral or written evidence. And we did get a feeling um, from people that they, they felt decisions were already made. Um, that they, if they had, how they found out about the giving evidence, um, quite often had been pure chance that they, 
I think um, our current chair says that the, the budget process is a big open secret where it is really easy to access and, and be part of the process, but only if you know about it and there needs to be more done. And so actually having some measures that we can look at in terms of progress for participation and inclusive, inclusivity in the budget process would be helpful as well. Just very quickly on the, the your latter point there about gender, um, a, a, a gender inequality outcome. Um, at the last review prior to this one, um, as well as this one, you know, we, we have mentioned about the lack of um, cohesiveness between the, the national outcome indicators and the, the SDG indicators and the significant lack of a national outcome on gender equality or gender inequality. And I think that is and remains a gap. Um, I think having a specific national outcome on gender inequality could indeed support better gender budgeting. Um, it would clarify Scotland's commitment to addressing gender disparities and could also provide clear benchmarks uh, for evaluating budget allocations. But the challenge, as with any policy goal, um, lies in ensuring that there is action to deliver on the policy goal and achieve the outcomes which is meaningfully implemented and the budgetary commitments that genuinely reflect that aim. So the implementation gap is, is the key issue, I think, at hand as well for any of the outcomes. Thanks. Thank you. Sarah, I'd like to come in. Um, probably not a surprise that we believe a specific national outcome on, on gender equality would support gender budgeting. Um, and most importantly, we think there is a need for strong and clear indicators linked to budgets and monitoring systems that would drive action, for example, in embedding gender analysis across the policy areas. Without a specific national outcome on gender equality, there is a lack of consistency in the way that gender analysis is used in policy making, making it difficult to tackle systemic issues. Um, affecting women and girls. Um, and this is partly about a lack of specific targets um, that can be in place to drive actions um, across different policy areas. We also think that um, a, a specific national outcome would help um, increase policy coherence across um, existing and uh, forthcoming Scottish Government um, policies and strategies. So this could particularly be around the public sector equality duty, the equality mainstreaming strategy and the national strategy for economic transformation. Um, so the so um, yeah, the short answer is we we do agree uh, we do think this, a specific um, outcome on on gender equality is, is needed, um, and the the need for all um, lots of the out, all the outcomes to link back to budgets as well, um, and within the the detail that's given in the indicators. Great. I think that's very helpful, convener. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd, l I'd like to ask a question on that, on the open budget survey. It makes several recommendations for the Scottish Government on improving transparency. Um, has the SHRC engaged with the Scottish Government on approaches to implementing any of these recommended changes? Um, we have, I mean, I can outline some, some of the key engagements that, that we've had with the Government. Obviously, implementing the recommendations lies with Government, but... Um, Firstly, the, the, the first time we did the Open Budget Survey in 2019, we had no engagement from government. Um, we made many approaches to the Exchequer, but we, we didn't get any engagement at all in terms of being good practice to engage with the government around um, making sure for, for data, uh, data checking, fact checking, but also so that you could share what you were um, finding in terms of uh, key recommendations. But this time round, we, we achieved a, a commitment through the Open Government Partnership that the um, Budget Improvement Department would work with us, and they did um, very successfully work um, on the, the Open Budget Survey this time. So I want to, to just make a point of that. The relationship was instrumental in providing insight into the budgetary cycle and enhancing our understanding of the government's approach to fiscal transparency. And we valued this co collaboration, and it's fostered a good open dialogue, which is continuing. And the, the commitment to continued engagement was um, formalised within the um, our bag recommendations, where we requested that this be the case, and the government's response to that was that they would engage and did. Um, since the, the publication of the results, the, we have done um, we had an uh, um, OBS workshop with Scottish government officials. This was set up by Scottish government and had appropriate level uh, deputy director representatives from the Exchequer present, um, despite being the day that the, the financial um, 
changes were uh, announced. So, uh, you know, I was quite impressed <laughs> that they still turned up to my meeting. But they did have a really good and positive engagement with that. There were a lot of really interesting questions around um, the results and the recommendations and how the government could take that on board. So next step is to see what they actually do with that. But there, there was good engagement. Um, the engagement also continues through the Open Government Action Plan, um, which we are a member and we've presented to both Airbag and um, OGP on the findings. And then lastly, we provided a, a detailed briefing to, to all MSPs, including government ministers, and we did get quite a detailed um, reply from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and, and Local Government, indicating a commitment to review, um, to review and consider the, or the recommendations that we'd made but there were somewhat vague assurances of future action, so we're, we're still wanting to see more action there. Okay, Thanks. thank you for that. Um, that's us came to a close of this session. I just want to make sure and ask any members of the any other questions that they would like to ask the witnesses. Are you all content? You're all fine. Everybody online's nodding. Yeah. Um, and can I ask the witnesses, um, is there anything that you feel that, that hasn't been covered that you, you would like to raise with us before we close this session? I don't think so for me. No, I've covered everything. Okay, well, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. And we will now close and go into private to consider our evidence taken today. Thank you.